welcome back to uh, lesson four, part three, or 17.3 from the textbook. Dr. Ken here with you again. So now we're looking at resistance, inductance, and capacitance all in series. So rather than treating an inductor in series with a resistance by itself and a capacitor in series with a resistor by itself, we're now going to combine all three. So in an AC circuit, capacitance behaves in a similar but opposite way to inductance. Frequency, when frequency is increased, XL increases and XC decreases. The re reason for this is very simple. In XC, voltages are stored as static charges on plates. So as the frequency goes up, the resistance offered by the charge and discharge of those plates decreases because you've got more and more plate area. But the frequency XL increases opposite direction because it's storing energy as a magnetic field and that magnetic field is building up and then and then uh, collapsing that's the word I'm looking for so the magnetic field is building up and collapsing that collapsing then creates a voltage in the opposite direction which effectively increases so when frequency is increased, XL increases and XC decreases. It's because magnetic fields for XL and it's because of surface area on the capacitor for XC. Component value, when the component value, when the value is increased, XL increases and XC decreases. So if I have an increase in Henry's for an inductor, I will have an increase in reactance. When I have an increase in Farad's, I will have a decrease in XC, or capacitive reactance. They're working in opposites. And for phase angle in an RL circuit, the voltage leads the current. In an RC circuit, the voltage lags the current. So let's look at a little example here. Here we have an RLC series circuit and its wave, and we'll have a look at its waveforms in a minute. So we've got black is the voltage across the supply. You can see here my cursor. So here's our AC supply in black. We then have the voltage across the resistor in green, the voltage across the inductor, and again, here we have a pure inductor. So it's in blue, and we have a pure capacitor, which is in orange, and finally, our current, which is the same throughout the whole series circuit, of course, in red. So this being a series circuit we have in uh, in green as we said the voltage across the resistor and I'm just tracing that with my cursor now the voltage across the resistor the voltage across the inductor is blue and you can see there's a phase shift of 90 degrees relevant to the green and then a voltage across the capacitor in orange and again another 90 degrees but the opposite direction so you can actually see that the blue and the orange actually are 180 degrees apart from each other they are 90 degrees shifted from the green but they are 180 degrees shifted from each other when the blue is going to its maximum positive the orange is going to its maximum negative. 
So voltage is across a capacitor and inductor in a series circuit are 180 degrees out of phase from each other, giving us this nice um, bulbous type diagram. And you may uh, notice that uh, if you were to take just the three center cycles here, one, two, and three, and just look at those three, it looks like the logo for the ABC. And that's exactly where the ABC get their logo from. It's two sinusoidal waves displayed on an oscilloscope at 180 degrees from each other. So that's where the logo for the ABC actually comes from. So let's look at that as a phaser diagram now. So here's our phaser diagram. A we have our current on the horizontal in red and we have the voltage across the resistor in green in phase and again it's length representing the voltage and where it's positioned in phase with the current it has zero degrees. You'll see the voltage for the inductor in blue is in the vertical direction again it's length representing the magnitude and the position 90 degrees lead on the voltage across the resistor is straight up so the length is the actual voltage and its position is 90 degrees lead the capacitor is 90 degrees lag so the length of the phaser is its length and the angle in here is 90 degrees. So on the second diagram here, phaser, phaser diagram B, we've simply done a phaser addition of VL and VC. So basically, we've taken the length of VC and we've tipped to tailed it to VL. So VL is still underneath there, but we've tipped to tailed it so we're left with this result in here. So the result is here. Not a very good... Uh, drawing hard to do on the computer so effectively that little bit there is VL minus VC so over here you can see we've simply blown up the diagram a little bit or the phaser diagram and we've got the resultant of VL minus VC and we've still got R we now do a phaser addition between VR and VC this time using a parallelogram and close in the horizontal gives us the voltage applied and in here is the phase angle So the phase of, sorry, the phases for the voltages across a capacitor and inductor, they cancel each other out. And if they are exactly the same, they would cancel each other completely out. So giving a resultant phase which we call VL minus VC. In this case, VC is greater than VL, and so we end up with a phaser pointing down from the horizontal. If VC had been smaller than VL or VL had been larger than VC we would have ended up with a arrow or a phaser pointing up and our angle would have been above the line rather than below it or our total voltage would have been above rather than below and here we ha here we have an example of exactly that so our phaser diagram here 
we actually have VL minus VC. In this particular case, we have more inductive voltage across the uh, inductor, same resistance, and now our voltage ends up leading by the angle rather than lagging. So in a series AC circuit, when the voltage across the inductor is greater than the voltage across the capacitor, the applied voltage then leads the current. So impedance now in an RLC series circuit. In a series RLC circuit, the reactive phasor is the difference between the phases for the voltage across the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor. You can see it here in the formula. So XL minus XC gives us the capacity of reactants. Because they're 180 degrees out from each other, we can simply subtract them. Or what we're actually doing is we're adding a plus to a minus, which is the same as doing a subtraction. Therefore, we can apply Pythagoras' theorem to find the impedance of a series RLC circuit. So Z is equal to the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC all squared, and that will give us the Z for the circuit. And here you can see our impedance triangles, and the first on the left hand side, XL is greater than XC, so the vertical ends up being the predominant phasor and we end up with an impedance facing up this way on the hypotenuse. In other words, remember it's just rotating anti-clockwise. So in this particular case, the impedance is leading the resistance and it's leading by this phase angle in here. If our reactance, or if our XL is less than XC, then we're going to end up with this phasor coming down. We're going to end up still with our impedance on the hypotenuse. Our phasor diagram is still rotating anti-clockwise, so our impedance in this particular case will lag the resistance by the angle. So impedance triangles for RLC series circuits this is where the reactance is a difference between the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactances because basically XL and XC are opposite to each other at 180 degrees. So what about phase angle? To find the phase angle between current and applied voltage, we can use any of the three trigonometrical functions as you can see below depending on which values of the impedance triangle are known. So here's our impedance triangle. Z on the hypotenuse, R on the horizontal, and XL minus XC, giving us X, whatever it happens to be, on the vertical. So we can say that the angle theta is equal to cos to the minus 1 R on Z, so that's the R on the Z, which is cos. We could also say the angle is sine to the minus 1, x on z, that's x on z, which is sine, that's the opposite, on the hypotenuse, giving us sine. Or we could go tan to the minus 1, which is x on r, which is the opposite on the adjacent. So we can use cos, we can use sine. We can use tan. We just simply got to remember that X is simply XL minus XC. So, time for me to have a, a small break. I'm going to pause. Oh, well, I'd suggest you pause the video here and see if you can work out what the voltages are around this series circuit. So we have a series circuit here with 100 volts at 50 hertz. We have a resistor at 100 ohms. We have an inductor at 0.8 henrys and we have a capacitor at 10 microfarads. And we want to work out what uh, the 
voltages across each of these things, what the current through the circuit is, what the overall impedance might be. So pause the video here and then have a go and then uh, start the video again and I of course will then work through the answers with you. Well, I hope you've been able to work out the answers, so let's work through them together and see how you went. So, Z should have come out at uh, 120.5. We'll go into a bit more explanation in a minute on how we got there. The two, the current should have been uh, 0.38. Obviously, I equals V divided by R, so you would have had 100 volts divided by the 100. 20 ohms for the Z. A voltage across the resistor, you should have got 83 volts. Across the inductor, uh, 208.5, and across the capacitor, 264.4, and a an angle of 33.9 volts lagging. So how did we get there? How did? Let's have a look at how we got there in detail. So here are the values that we were told. We were told that resistance of 100 ohms, inductance of 0.8 henrys or 800 millihenrys, 10 microfarads for the capacitor, 100 volts apply, 50 hertz. So to find the impedance, first calculate the inductive and capacitive values. So XL is 2 pi FL, which is going to be 6.28 multiplied by 50 times 0.8 gave us 251.2 ohms. So that was the XL, the inductive reactance. XC, we need to find out the capacitive reactance. That's 1 on 2 pi FC. So we're given us 1 on 6.28, I should say, multiplied by 50, multiplied by 10, times 10 to the minus 6, giving us 318.5 ohms. Remembering that the XC and the XL are 180 degrees from each other, we can then say that the Z is the square root of R squared XL minus XC squared. So we would have had square root of 100 squared plus 251 minus 318 squared. Now that subtraction needs to be done first, then squared. A lot of people fall in the trap and square these first and then subtract them, no, 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 no. You must subtract them and then do the square because that's why we've put the parentheses in there. So in this particular case, the Z will be the square root of 10,000 plus minus 67.32 to the squared, which gives us the square root of 14,529.3, giving us a Z of 120.3. 5 ohms. So a little bit of process required there to get to the Z. We had to work out what the inductive reactance was, then the capacitive reactance, then we had to use Pythagoras to find the Z. How can we calculate the current? Well, we have the Z and we have the applied voltage, therefore it is simply Ohm's law, I equals V divided by Z which is going to be 100 divided by 120, which gave us our current at 0 0.83 amps. Then simple process then to calculate the voltage drops. We know what each of the um, reactances were across each of the other components. We know what the current is, so it's simple application of Ohm's law. The voltage across the resistance is the current multiplied by the resistance, giving us 0.83 multiplied by 100 gives us 83 volts. The voltage across the inductor, the current multiplied by the inductive reactance, which again 0.83 multiplied by 251.2 is 208.5 volts. And then finally, the voltage across the capacitor, IXC, would be 0 0.83 multiplied by 318.5, giving us 264.4 volts. One final step to go. 
we've got to calculate the phase angle. Remember we have a Z and we have R, so we're going to go down the cos path. So the angle is cos to the minus 1 R divided by Z. So cos to the minus 1, 100 divided by 120.5 is cos to the minus 1, 0 0.83, giving us an angle of 33.9 degrees and the voltage is lagging the current. So again, just drawn as a phasor diagram now. So we have our current as our reference. That's the most important part to remember, the current. We have the voltage across the resistor at 83. We have the voltage on the inductor vertically at 208. And vertically down, we have the voltage across the capacitor at 264. We then subtract the um, 208 minus 264 it's going to give us minus 55.9 so we're going to end up in the bottom part here vertically so there's our minus 55.9 our 83 volts we close the phasor diagram using a parallelogram to get the hypotenuse and we will end up with an angle of 33.9 degrees and it's lagging because we're down here remembering our phasor diagram is rotating anti-clockwise in this direction therefore the applied voltage will always be lagging the current so the voltage across the capacitor and the inductor are both higher than the supply voltage so there's a, uh, an important thing to note, that uh, the supply voltage is uh, smaller than the voltage across the inductor or the voltage across the capacitor. That can often happen in AC circuits that have reactances in them. Again, demonstrating you just can't add up the voltages in an AC circuit you can only add them up using a phasor diagram or a little bit of trigonometry and a little bit of Pythagoras. So let's sum up this particular section, part three. In an RLC series AC circuit, the voltage across the capacitor and inductor cancel each other out because they are at 180 degrees out of phase with each other. They are 90 degrees out of phase from the reference, but they are 180 degrees out of phase with each other. If the inductive reactance in a series RLC circuit is greater than the capacitive reactance, the circuit is inductive and the supply voltage will lead the current. And conversely, if the capacitive reactance is greater in quantity, the circuit is capacitive and the circuit voltage will lag the current. And finally, if the capacitive and inductive reactances are equal, the circuit is purely resistive and the supply voltage and currents are in phase. This is called a special case which is called resonance, which we will cover in the next lesson. The, uh, secondly, impedance of an RLC circuit is given by the formula Z equals the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC and then square them. Again, I'll point it out just to remind you, you must find out the XL, the XC, subtract them, then square them, not the other way around. Then find the square root of the addition, and that will give you the impedance. A high voltage can exist across reactive components in RLC circuits, and that's something to be very aware of, that quite often you might only have a few hundred volts across the reactive components, sorry, the supply, but have much higher voltages across the reactive components. And as we get into resonance, will certainly make this very clear, it becomes very obvious. 
And finally, our phase angle can be found with theta is equal cos to the minus 1 r on z. Of course, you can use tan, you can use sine if you have the other sides of the triangle, but typically we have the resistance because it's nice and easy, and we have the hypotenuse, which is z, making cos just a typical easy way to work out what the phase angle is.